Hi, I'm Jabril Kalon, and my partner is Damon McNally, and we are going to try to explain to you the problem of volume conduction. Now, we're going to try to do this in a qualitative way using basic models to give you an overview of the concepts, which will hopefully help you understand the process better. Now, in medical physics, we want to measure a lot of information that's inside the body, but this is more convenient if we do it from outside. So we can choose properties to measure, you know, properties of the body. So one type of property we can measure is the electrical properties of tissue. So we are familiar with the standard ECG and EEG. ECG measures the, sig the electrical signals across the heart, and EEG gives the electrical signals being fired around the brain. These signals have to propagate through tissue. So we need to have an electrical model of tissue to help us with this. Have tissue, you can think of it as a conductor, which has free electrons moving around as you would in a metal. And this electron here, for example, you can see, has freedom to move. So it can propagate the signal, the electrical signal that comes through. But you can also have it as an insulator, so you can model that as a bound charge. That wobble, it's because you can think of it like this. If a signal comes in and hits a charge that's bound, it only displaces slightly, so it's, the signal is not propagated as much, and so it's attenuated. So now this leads us to the crux of the of volume conduction, of the problem of volume conduction. Imagine we had a signal moving from a source through tissue. The strength of the signal decreases as the distance from this source increases, simply because tissue has natural impedance. And this leads to the attenuation I was speaking about before. But at the same time, you have the conductive effects allowing the signal to reach the skin. So let's look at how this would work. So you have a source propagating a signal, goes through tissue, gets to the skin, gets to the electrode, and we get a reading. Another problem of volume conduction is dispersion. And this comes about because the tissue is anisotropic. This means it has properties that are direction dependent. It also means that it's electrically heterogeneous, so it's not the same everywhere. This is best explained like this. So it's anisotropic, its properties are dependent on direction. We use a finite element model to explain anisotropy. Each of the small cylinders you see in front of you would be then a finite element of conductivities depending on their color. So we chose green to be go, red to be stop, and yellow attenuates the signal slightly. So the signal propagates like this. It stops at the red, but it goes at the green. So it stops and goes and stops and goes. And as it goes through, you can see it follows like a path of least resistance. So there's a preferred path in the conductivity's direction dependent. But one Zeus lightning bolt becoming three signals. And this, this makes it more obvious why you need all these complex analysis tools to analyze a signal, because you can imagine this happening on a much bigger scale. This particular model is encountered in the forward and inverse problem. Think of the forward problem as you're determining the body surface potentials from heart potentials, and the inverse problem is finding the heart potentials from the body potentials. And all of this is obviously mediated by the conductivities of the tissue within. Let's talk about the heart for a second. The heart is enclosed in a 3D volume, so the signal fires in 3D space, so you can have all these different electrode placements. The heart is enclosed by lungs, bones, skeletal muscle, and in most cases, fat. All of these are heterogeneous and lead to anisotropy, which I was talking about before. The lungs especially are a problem because they inflate and deflate, meaning that over time the volume of air in the lungs is not constant, it changes. As we know then, air is an electrical insulator. So this must mean that inhaling or exhaling should produce different signals. The second example is the skull. We need to look at how we model the skull when we do measurements. One way to model the skull is by saying it's a smooth spherical object. This is obviously not true. In cases where the skull has lesions, these can add to its anisotropy because it's bone. Uh, and the skull itself gives a smearing effect of the signals you measure because of all these uh, factors. 
at each electrode, you also get a linear, linear combination of signals coming from all over the brain. So EEGs are famous for very poor spatial resolutions, i.e. you can't tell exactly where one signal is coming from at one electrode, but very good temporal resolution. Let's summarize all of this with a basic model. So we have an axon propagating a signal, and we have an electrode that's placed on the skin, or sometimes even in vivo. But in most cases, it's placed somewhere away from the source. We agree with that. This signal propagates through tissue, undergoes some effects described here, so attenuation, dispersion, and then is picked up by the electrode. It's analyzed computationally, and then we get a reading. And that's, you can see here, by the Zeus lightning bolt. Reading. Well, that's all from us. We hope this has been helpful. Thank you. This is Daybot. Goodbye. This is Jibbot. Goodbye.